Mm -hmm. Jai Gurdiv, Jai Masters. The more you grow, because growth happens in stages. People grow and they think they're somewhere, else, and then they wake up to the next level and they realize they weren't. And that's how it's supposed to be, otherwise you're not growing. It's that simple. Growth means change. Growth doesn't mean I'm there, it stays the same. That's not growing. A plant doesn't grow by staying the same. Growth always means change. The question becomes, how are you changing? What direction, et cetera, et cetera. So if you realize that you're constantly going to realize that what you think is going on is not, and where you think you're at is not, that's a very great state. That's what Ram Rast means when he says, becoming nobody. That's the only state that actually works, is when you have stopped defining yourself. Not what you define yourself as. This is very far gone, if you understand that. It takes very, very deep to go to that state. Like, before you wake up, you define yourself as, I want this, I want that, I need this, this is what happened to me, and you've made this, you talk about the story, my story, that's big now. Everyone, you tell your story, what's your story? And what they mean is, the rap that's going on inside your head. How are you defining yourself based upon the events that happened to you? And that's before you wake up, and even after you wake up. That's how you define yourself. I am the person that this happened to. I am so-and-so's wife. I am so-and-so's husband. No, that's not who you are. That is something that happened to you. You got married. If you hadn't gotten married, you would still exist. So you have to be very careful in defining yourself. Because if you define yourself as I'm so-and-so's husband or so-and-so's wife and they leave or die, you're in big trouble. That doesn't mean you can't love with all your heart. But you don't define yourself as an experience you had or an experience you're having. You're the one that's having the experience. You're the one that's aware that you stood at the altar. You're the one that's aware you sat at the divorce table. It's not who you are. I'm not the person who got divorced. I'm not the person that so-and-so used to love and now they don't, or, or such and such used to happen, or, or I used to be young and now I'm old. No, none of those are who you are. You're the person that was in there when you were young, experiencing being young. You're the person that was in there older, experience being older, and then you're going to be the person in there experience being very old. And then you're going to experience being in there when you're dying. You're not dying. You're experiencing a body dying. Believe me, you're going to have that experience. You will be lying there in the bed, right? Let's just say of a nice quiet death. I don't know if it's better. Who knows? Nothing's better than anything else. But you're lying there and you have trouble breathing. And I, you've been with people that, that are dying, and they can sometimes reach a state where they don't talk anymore. They don't talk. They're still in there. They're still in there. And they are, they are noticing all these changes that are going on as the body starts to shut down. You will be there. The same you that's here listening to me right now, just as clear, unless you panic, and I don't want you to, you will be in there noticing that these changes are taking place. Okay? And that you who's in there then has been in there the whole time. Let me ask you a question. If you look in the mirror now, do you see your reflection? Well, you see a reflection. I don't want to call it your reflection. You look in the mirror, you see a reflection. It's not your reflection. You don't have a reflection. Your consciousness. Consciousness doesn't have any form. It's awareness. It's awareness. And so it's aware of the reflection in the mirror. Very, very good. Did you look in the mirror yesterday? Just say you did. Were you there? Were you in there noticing what the reflection was? How about five days ago? How about a year ago? How about ten years ago? You are in there. <laughs> it's so funny. The body changes, but the reflection changes because it's reflecting something that changed. You don't. Not the awareness itself. When you looked in the mirror when you were five years old, it didn't look like this. But you were looking. Consciousness has been in there the whole time. You're always conscious. It's just a question of what you're conscious of. This is real spirituality. It's the core of all spirituality. It's not about what you say or what you eat or what you wear or what you believe. No, no. Those are the body. Those are the thoughts. Those are the emotions. It's not about what you feel, what you think, what you believe, what you look like. It's about the one who's looking. It's about the consciousness that is aware 
I ask you, are there thoughts going on in there? Does anybody have thoughts? How do you know? That's the ultimate spiritual question. Nothing else has any meaning. How do you know you have, I don't know you have thoughts. I'm looking right at you. I don't see a single one of them. How do you know you have thoughts? Because you are conscious. You are aware. Otherwise, they could go on and no one would know. <laughs> right? I don't know your thoughts are going on. So maybe you don't, wouldn't know either. But you do know, don't you? Therefore, I'm telling you, nothing is non-spiritual. Nothing is non-spiritual if you understand it's about consciousness. So if you say to me, maybe I can't meditate. My mind just won't shut up. That's a very, very holy statement. That's a very high statement. I'm, I'm going to put on to you. I mean, you don't understand what I said. I said, I can't meditate. My mind won't shut up. How do you know? How do you know? You know because you're in there and you notice that it's going on. If nothing else, the time you sit down to meditate, it doesn't matter whether you get in or not. What matters is that when you get up, you notice that your thoughts didn't stop. You don't notice that all day. You're too busy with them. You're busy being lost in them. So if you literally sit there and say, I've got it for meditation and my mind didn't stop, like I'm telling you, how do you know? How do you know it didn't stop? And I think it's even neater because you tried to stop it and it didn't stop. <laughs> and how do you know that? Because you are a conscious being. The consciousness is everything. If you get into deep meditation, you come back like this. Oh my God. I went so deep. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? Let's take sleep. That's an easier one for you guys. I do assume that you all sleep, okay? And some of you dream. You wake up. You tell somebody, oh my God, I had this unbelievable dream. A spiritual person, they'll be nice and listen, doesn't care about your dream or interpreting it. Or did it have mystical meaning and so on? Go on. Get lost in that if you want to. What matters is, how do you know that you had the dream? I thought you were asleep. I don't understand. You're not there. I walked into your room. I called your name. You didn't budge. How do you know there was a dream? More important, when you wake up and you see the world and the people and you say, oh, I had this unbelievable dream. You who seen the people, are you the one who noticed the dream? Is it the same awareness of being that noticed the dream state going on with all the people in the buildings and all this stuff, and when it wakes up, it notices this state? If it wasn't the same consciousness, it wouldn't know what it experienced. They would have to phone call each other or something. It's the same consciousness. The consciousness that looked in the mirror when you were five, the consciousness that looked in the mirror when you were 65, the consciousness that noticed the dream going on, the consciousness that still knew that it experienced the dream and it had emotions. There were emotions in the dream. Oh my God, I was, like you used the word I. I was so scared. I was dying. Then you wake up and say, I'm telling you about the dream. Is that the same I? It's all about the consciousness, the awareness of being. That's what spirituality is about. Someone once asked Yogananda, I want to know God. I want to know God. Fully enlightened master. I want to know God. He kept pestering him. I want to know God. He turned around nonchalantly. He looked at me and said, he dwells right behind your every thought. He dwells right behind your every thought. What dwells right behind your every thought? The awareness of the thought. If it was not there, you wouldn't know you had a thought. I want to know God. You just did. So as you grow, there's nothing higher than realizing you're the consciousness. All right? I had this experience. Oh my God, it was so transcendental. It was unbelievable. I saw Christ and Buddha and I could actually touch them. When did it happen? A year ago, I want to tell you about it. Meaningless. You who experienced it are higher than what you experienced. There is nothing higher than consciousness. All right? Hey, movies can make visions like that. You make a hologram. All kinds of things can happen. Who sees it? Who's aware that it took place? That is what spirituality is. It is about returning to the seat of self. It is about self-realization. You've heard that. That is your seat of self. I tell it in, in The Untethered Soul. I go through it very slowly, all right? If you're in a room and there's all kinds of people, things, furniture, stuff going on in the room, all right? Are you aware? Yes. You're aware. Very good. 
What happens if the people leave? Are you aware they left? Yep. Are you any different because they left? Nope. You are the consciousness. They are the objects of consciousness. A light shines on something. If you take the something away, the light is still the light. It was never the thing it was shining on anyways. You were not what you were looking at. You were the one who was looking. Now, let's take the furniture away. <laughs> we'll leave a piano. All furniture gets taken away. An empty room but a piano. Are you aware that the furniture's gone? Is it the same awareness that was aware that the people were there and then gone, aware the furniture was there and then gone? You're not changing. The room changed. The furniture's gone. The awareness did not change one iota, did it? It was the exact same awareness that was aware that the people were there, that was aware the furniture was there. Now it's aware there's just a piano. Okay, take the piano away. Are you aware? Oh, the piano's gone. But you're still aware. You're conscious of it. Okay? Now, I'm going to do something very mystical. Ready? The room's going to disappear. Magic. The room disappears. Are you aware that the room is gone? You see, you care more about, oh, magic. No. I want to know who is aware that the room is gone. Is it the same one that was aware that the room was there? The same one that was aware the people were there? The same one that was aware the furniture was there? You are not changing. The consciousness has never changed. What it's aware of changes. Just like the light shines on different things, the light is transcendent to what it's shining on. Your consciousness is transcendent to what it's paying attention to, to what the objects of consciousness are. Right? Now we'll go deeper. Now that the room is gone, what's left? You have thoughts. Oh my God, there used to be people here. And now the room, see? The room's gone. The people are gone. But still you can have thoughts, can't you? You're having thoughts about something that's not there. Okay, fine. Have thoughts. Now the th thoughts stop. It's called meditation. Wait. Here are the thoughts. What happened to the room? I don't understand. How could the room disappear? This is weird. There were people here. Where'd they go? I hope they didn't disappear. And there it is. Thoughts. Correct? And all of a sudden, they stop. Are you aware that they stopped? Are you aware? If you go deep in meditation and you come back and say, oh my God, first time, all the thoughts stopped. How do you know? You're, you're having a thought that says, God, I really like this guy. I wonder if he likes me. And then something happens and you, you get distracted. Your mind goes somewhere else. Are you aware that you were thinking about this guy and now you're thinking about something else? Is it the same you? I, well, I started to do something very bad, but I'll, I'll do it because I like to do bad things. All right? I really like this guy. Then he, you know, he does something weird. He picks his nose or he wears a bow tie to pick you up or something. And then your mind says, oh my God, was I wrong? I don't like this guy at all. Was it the same you who noticed that the mind was saying I like it and now the mind saying I don't like it? Yes or no? This is very deep. As simple as this is, this is far beyond mystical stuff, all right? This is real. So now the thoughts are gone. You are aware. Of course you're aware the thoughts are gone. You have days, you have bad thought days, and you have good thought days. Does your mind ever go negative on you? Yes or no? Does your mind ever go positive on you? Not so much, but it does. <laughs> are you aware? Are you aware? Oh, my God. You know, before I walked outside, I, my mind was complaining about everything. Now it's just talking about how beautiful it is. Who knows that? The same one is there. If people talk about, I'm, I'm having trouble making a decision. Can we talk about that? Because you guys have trouble with that. Do you, you have trouble making decisions? Okay, here's the mind. I think I should do it this way. Yeah, I'm going to do it that way. No. Because they, they can be like, yeah, but yeah, ever have a little argument going on is it the same you that's noticing both sides of the argument? Yes or no? Well, you guys are great. I love talking to you. All right? You must be already there. You're enlightened or something, right? So that consciousness, I've told you, it's the same throughout all of it. All right. So now the room is gone. People are gone. Now the thoughts stop. Okay? But you're still there. Who's there? Who is it that's there? Obviously, that's you, because you stayed the same throughout the whole thing. That's the core of your being. That's what they mean by soul. That's what they mean by Atman. 
That is the self, the essence of your being. Just to make sure, what if the consciousness turns off? Are you there? No. There's nobody there at all. If, there is no switch, by the way. Don't worry. The consciousness can't turn off. It's been on. No. I'm going to give you a quiz. I'll give you a quiz when we're finished, right? How long has consciousness been there? They asked Mayor Baba, a fully enlightened master, a great, great being. They said, Baba, who are you? He said, I was in the beginning before all else was created. I will be in the end after all else falls away. There was never a time I was not, and there will never be a time I will not be. That's who you are. That's what consciousness is, period. So, like I said, you were there through all these changes because you're conscious. If I turned off consciousness, obviously you're not there. But it has never been turned off. I like the comic strips where somebody gets knocked out. They get knocked unconscious. See, Mickey, you're wrong. There could be non-consciousness. They get knocked unconscious. How come they see stars? People go into states that medicine says they're unconscious. What medicine means by consciousness is you're conscious of the outside world. Okay? He's been knocked unconscious. And he comes back and says, oh my God, I saw all these lights and it was far out. It's like, you're still there. You're always there. People have near-death experiences where medicine says their heart stopped, their breath stopped, all metabolic processes stopped. Okay? Flat line. They come back. Yes? It happens, right? And they tell you what happened while they were gone. Whoa, I don't understand. Non-compute. Consciousness is always there. It is just a question of what it's conscious of. And by the way, if the doctors say, no, no, those are just leftover uh, patterns in the mind that are spitting out these things, and that's what they're seeing. Who's seeing it? When you're really, really gone and become nobody, you don't argue with anybody. Because consciousness is always right. It's always what is. So if you're actually leaving and going through the tunnel and seeing lights and meeting Grandpa and all that, wonderful, it's beautiful. Who did that? How do you know? Because I'm conscious. Same consciousness. If indeed it's just leftover neural patterns, neural pathways sparking, and you're seeing that, it means you're still there. The continuity never changed. It's just a question of what you're conscious of. Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, as deep as it gets, wrote that when you go to sleep, you dream. You're aware of your dreams. If you go into deep, deep sleep, there are no dreams. That doesn't mean you're not conscious. You're conscious of nothing. That's where deep meditation goes. The senses fall away. I'm not conscious. Do they fall away? No, they're there, but you're not conscious of them. It's called pratyahara. You withdrew your consciousness from the senses. The yogi state is when the consciousness is not being distracted by the senses. Therefore, it sits deeper inside of itself. That's called pratyahara. This is all deep stuff, but it's all just about consciousness. And then it goes deeper and deeper. When you go past that and then you go past the thoughts, ultimately, you're seated in the seat of self. Muktananda Baba, it's so beautiful. Meditate on the self. Honor and worship your own being, for God dwells within you as you. Same thing. You know who else said it? I like quoting Christ after saying that that saying of Baba's. The kingdom is within you. Now you understand which you it's in. It's in you. It's in the you. It's in the essence of your being. They're all teaching the same thing. All the great ones taught the same thing. No matter what tradition they came from, no matter what language they spoke in. Why? Because it's the truth. You are a very great being, but you are looking at something eh, not so great. <laughs> You're staring at a mind that's got serious problems. <laughs> so the consciousness can be aware of anything, but it, it's, I would come back to this magic. Like people say, if consciousness is God, and consciousness and it is. If consciousness is God, in, in yoga we call it Satchitananda, eternal conscious ecstasy. That's who you are. That is the state of your being. Consciousness has a nature. Its nature is ecstasy. That's God's nature, ecstasy. He's not sitting there judging you. It's an ecstasy, all right? 
and basically it, you better watch the ego because it's like the ego doesn't get to say oh I, they said I'm God no they didn't say you were God <laughs> they said that which is watching you be an idiot saying you're God <laughs> is God <laughs> the consciousness itself there's just one consciousness there's one consciousness and it's being distracted by different objects this is how you should see it there's just consciousness one consciousness Consciousness can get distracted, can't it? You ever find that you're paying attention and you're paying attention to something else? Ever read a book and then realize you didn't read one single word and just turn the pages back? Your consciousness can be in the mind, your consciousness can be in the world, your consciousness can be in your emotions. It can go anywhere, can't it? And it gets distracted. If all of a sudden some great love comes up in your heart, you're not doing anything else. It's, you're there, that's it. I don't care what happened before that. You're not even thinking about it. You're there. And if the same thing, you know, some, some fear, an overwhelming fear comes up, that's true. There you go. Your consciousness, boom, gets pulled right down into it. Consciousness is aware, and awareness is capable of being distracted by an object of consciousness. Here, we're taking our physics class. You know, Newton had his laws. Consciousness is awareness. That's its nature. Awareness can be distracted by a loud noise, by a feeling, by a thought, by an emotion. So the consciousness gets drawn down to the distracting object. Did it actually get drawn down? Does a light have to leave in order to shine on something? Do I have to leave this seat in order to project my consciousness onto that picture or on the outside world? No, I still stay here. The sun is 93 million miles away sitting in the sky. It's been there for 4.5 billion years. It doesn't know the word day. It doesn't know the word night. It doesn't know the word summer. It doesn't know the word winter. It does not know one single thing. It's just shining for all this time. Yet the light falls on the earth. It doesn't leave. Your consciousness does not leave. What does that mean? It means you are right now seated in the divine ecstasy of God. Right now, right now. I don't care if you're in the deepest state of depression. I don't care what's going on in your life. Anything doesn't make any difference. That's where you're seated. And you are being distracted by your thoughts. That's okay. God's being distracted by his thoughts. God's being distracted by his thoughts. God's being distracted by her thoughts. The same consciousness, just like the sun, all the rays of the sun fall on the earth. They just fall in different places. Each individual ray falls on different places. If there's one sun, there's one consciousness, and it's being drawn down by the distraction of your thoughts, your emotions, your senses. Can anybody hear me? You're a very great being. That's why the saying, I need to find my way back to God, no, no. You need to stop leaving. See the difference? It will change your entire path if you understand the truth. That's why we teach it. Okay, like I said, you're going to go through many stages. So you go through a stage, I want to find God, I want to find God. Okay, I, 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 I've been that way my whole life. <laughs> my whole adult life. The beautiful saint, my Yog Shakti, who brought us the Durga statue back in the 70s. She was a very high being, very, very high. She left the body a few years ago, but very quiet. She didn't want anyone to know her. Very, very high being. And we respected her very much, and I was alone with her once. And I cried at her feet. And I said, Mother, I, I want to know God. I want to know God. <laughs> she just put her hand up. She just, it'll happen. That's deep. That which is struggling. God came down, got lost in your mind, and now your mind wants to know God. It's deeper than that. That's what I was saying. All these different stages you're going to go through, you think there's something until you realize there's nothing. Becoming nobody. When there's nothing going on in there, when there's nothing going on in there distracting the consciousness, it knows who it is. And once it knows who it is, it's able to sit in there. That's witness consciousness. I, I always teach, witness consciousness is not such a high state. People write me, they say, how could you say that? All right, I'll show you how I say that. Witness consciousness is you've achieved a state where your awareness is not being distracted as much by your thoughts, your emotions, the form, and things outside. Therefore, you can stay conscious while those other things are going on. Instead of getting upset, or freaking out, or running after what you want, running away from, you hear me, okay? You're busy doing something. Witness consciousness means those things are going on, but you're not being pulled down into them. And they get quieter when you're not pulled down into them. 
If you're pulled down into it, you splash around and make a lot of noise. It makes it worse. People once asked me, does the voice stop when you reach a very deep state? The voice is noisy now because you're in six inches of water, face down, splashing, thrashing around, and the water is splashing into your nose and your face, and you're screaming, I'm drowning. No, you're not drowning. You're in six inches of water. If you will stop making a mess, the mind will stop being a mess. There's nothing wrong with the mind, except for the fact that you're in there screwing it up. You're in there, oh my God, what am I going to do? I have to, oh, what if he didn't like me? Oh my God, I, just, I dropped something in my pants. Okay, when will the voice stop talking? When you stop doing that. It is not its nature to be a neurotic. It's just you drop down, got lost in what you're distracted by, and now you're thrashing around in it, making everything much worse. So you come to understand, let's talk about witness consciousness. Witness consciousness is a very beautiful state. You are able to handle the things that are happening outside without freaking out. Your mind no longer ever says, I can't handle this. Because if you can't handle it, you're not in witness consciousness. You got drawn. That's what, by the way, can't handle it means. I can't stay centered when that has taken place. I can't stay seated where I was <laughs> before it happened. I can't stay seated where I was in this peaceful state, whatever. I was conscious. I, you're always conscious, but I was conscious of being conscious. That's witness consciousness. I was aware that I'm aware, not boom, anger and fear and love and drives and all kinds of stuff drew my consciousness out of that seat. It got lost in the object of consciousness. Anybody listening? I know that never happens to you, right? It got lost in the object of consciousness. Now you're not centered, as a centered means, that the consciousness is focused in a centered position as opposed to being scattered all over the place, all right? So there's witness consciousness. Eventually you will reach a state. It's called becoming established in the seat of self. Becoming established in the seat of self. That's witness consciousness. You won't leave. You don't have to try. It's not effort. You just have let go enough of the noise and you realize it's much more beautiful in here than anything can be out there. Then you will leave. In fact, you will find out at some point, and many of you have found out, you wouldn't be here, that anything beautiful you felt from out here was because it caused your mind to shut up and your heart to open and you felt what's in there. That's where you feel it. You feel love inside. You don't feel it outside. It is going on inside of you. But not always. It's going on inside of you when you're open. When your heart is open and your mind is open. So yes, there are things that can happen outside that help your psyche to shut up. Don't they? Like you sunset, all of a sudden you turn the corner and there's a beautiful sunset and there's just silence. It just shuts up. It can happen. And you know what you say? It was like I was in the presence of God. You were, because you're in the presence of yourself instead of being completely lost in the mind and the emotions. So witness consciousness is you have achieved a relatively high state in which the world or your mind nor your emotions are strong enough to pull you down out of the seat and get involved. Can you get involved? Yes, you choose to. I have to deal with this situation. I mean, my child has a problem, or this happened, or that happened. No matter how big the problem, no matter how big the problem, that's where you're at. Okay, there's a big problem. We'll deal with it. Not, I am. The difference? Okay. That's witness consciousness. Why do I say it's not a high state? It seems pretty high to me that somebody can become established in that seat and then from then on make conscious. It's called a conscious decision as opposed to a reactive decision. All these words come home now, don't they? A reactive decision means I can't stay seated in the seat of self because the emotion or the thought or the world distracted me so much that I got drawn out of that seat and now I'm reacting to try and be okay because I'm not okay. And by the way, even if it's a positive thing, you're not okay. The most positive thing in the world, you meet somebody, it's love at first sight, you're freaking out, it's just so beautiful, right? You're in trouble. <laughs> Why? 
because they better stay and this better happen and they better be the way you want it to be and everybody better leave them alone and better not go talk to somebody else. Okay? So it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. The truth of the matter is if you're pulled out of the seat of consciousness, then you think that thing out there is where the beauty is coming from. No. That person, place, thing, a dog can do it. A car can do it. Really, seriously. And uh, people love the horses. They stand next to it. They just get blown away. And say, don't, don't limit it to people. All right? So basically, this thing outside has hit your mind and your emotions. We'll talk about that later. Hit your mind and emotions in a way that caused them to open. I'm open. I'm very open to this. I'm not. I saw the horse. I got thrown off horse when I was young. I can't get near horses. I love horses. I won, you know, the riding contest when I was five and ever since. So your past experiences determine how the current thing is going to affect your mind. Your past experiences determine how the current events in front of you will affect your mind and your emotions. Is that true or not? Psychology says man is the sum of his learned experiences. No. You are the consciousness that's aware that your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. Your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. That's why you like something and she freaks out over it. By the way, you liked something five minutes ago. Now you're freaking out over it. Why? You learned one more thing. Oh, my God. I, I love that. I didn't know he was a serial killer. I, oh, my God. I'm freaking out. and don't touch me. <laughs> it didn't even take five minutes. One second. One more piece of information into your psyche. Everything changes. I love it to pieces. And we're supposed to be stable. <laughs> That's really funny. All right? Because you're always having different experiences. And by the way, can you have an experience now, or yesterday, that conflicted with an experience you had when you were 10? Now you are what they call conflicted. That's why. So basically, you come back and understand that things distract the consciousness. When you can achieve witness consciousness, they don't distract it as much. You're able to stay seated. This is where this happens. I said as much. Okay, all of a sudden something happens that's pretty big. You'll feel, oh, I'm going to cry. You will feel when something happens that would distract you and used to distract you in the past, it's like a rubber band. It starts to pull on the center and you feel it. You actually feel an energetic pull and then you let go and it comes back. That's what letting go means. You know, I use that word a lot. Letting go doesn't mean renouncing the world. Letting go means you're in there and you're relatively centered, okay? Now something happened that is going to pull you out of that seat. You just went in to talk to somebody about a sensitive subject that you always get into arguments about, but you don't want to get into an argument. So you spend some time meditating, you got quiet, you breathe, you do all kinds of stuff, and you say, I'm not going to get into an argument about this. Let's just avoid that subject. We get along really well except for that subject. And you're centered, relatively. And you walk in there, and you start talking, and then inevitably, inevitably, it has to, okay? It's called a sensitive subject. Sensitive subjects tend to be sensitive. Something tends to touch them. So if you're a sensitive part of your body, okay, it's very sensitive. Something, every, the wind bothers it, okay? You walk in that room with a sensitive subject, good luck. So something happens, and you will feel from your seat, wherever the seat, no matter how deep the seat is, there it is, you will feel yourself start to get pulled down into the patterns that were the argument, the patterns. You will feel that pull. That's natural. Why? Because the psyche has a problem. It didn't go away because you said, I don't want to have a problem. <laughs> it did it. But you have the right to be transcendent to it, to sit above it and get centered. But then you'll feel the consciousness get pulled down. So we're talking about the distraction, isn't it? Most of the time, you'll just get pulled down you go through your little stupid argument, you walk out, and 10 minutes later, you go, oh my God, I promised myself I wouldn't do that again. What does that mean? You got pulled back. It let go of what was pulling it down, and by itself, it goes back, because that's your seed. And then you look at it, and it looks stupid. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe I let that happen. Or, and this is the worst part, don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. You have the right to fall and get up and fall and get up. But don't do this. You get pulled down, you get in your argument, and then you start to get pulled back, but you realize that's not going to feel good. I, I don't want to feel embarrassed. I don't feel I did something wrong. And you start saying, no, 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 it was them. 
It was them. I didn't. I, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Let them get away with that. I have to have boundaries. That's to be things. You're dead. You just signed death to your spiritual growth because you said I'm not letting go, and you just defined a, a psyche, an ego that made it fit inside of your lower self instead of letting go. Please don't do that. It's okay to fall. It's okay to be pulled off center. Let it go back. Let it go back. And then do what? Don't feel bad about it. Sit there and say, that's what it means to grow. You know what you should do about a situation like that? The minute you come back, you got to watch it. The second you come back, wow, that was a growth experience. I'll do better next time. That's it. That's the end of it. No more thoughts. No more nothing. No guilt. No shame. No blame. Don't play games. Come back. All right. So that's maintaining your center. You do it by how? By practice. I see this all the time. It's not about just meditating or about being committed and struggling. No, I don't want you to struggle. I want you to go down to the lowest common denominator that you could handle. Who cares? <laughs> Fine. The driver in front of me is driving slow for three blocks. I don't have to complain. I don't have to be making a thing out of it. I don't have to talk to them. They don't hear me anyways. I call it low-hanging fruit. Start with these small things in life that pull you down for no reason. If you want to stay up, at least wait for the big stuff. Don't no, no, sell out for nothing. I, I call that like, I'll give you a penny, you give me a million dollars. I'll do it all day. You're sitting there trading off your journey to God because the guy is driving slower than you want him to or because it's hot out, or because it's raining, or because somebody didn't say hello when you said hello to them, or because you dropped something in your pants and you're going to go back to work. No, no. Every one of you are capable of not doing that. You're capable of saying, okay, that's good practice. Like practicing your scales on a piano. You practice being centered. This is spiritual growth. If you do this every day, every minute of every day, don't worry about the big stuff. You'll deal with that when the time comes. You'll get pulled down. It's okay. Don't worry. You get pulled down, just say, oh, that's the big stuff. I'm giving permission there because you're not going to be able to do anything about it anyways. If you can't handle a lob on a tennis ball, backhand or forehand, you're not going to play tennis. There's not a chance in the world. Anybody can handle a lob, but it goes in a net. Try again. Anybody at some point can handle a lob and get it over the net. That's like playing the piano, playing the scales. Start with what you're capable of doing and do it. Don't think it doesn't matter. Does it matter that you practice hitting the tennis ball lob across the net? Or is that a waste of time? Is it a waste of time to play the scales on the piano if you don't know how to play the piano? Is it a waste of time to practice something so you get good at it? Practice this. I beg you, nothing is too small. You are in there. You have the right to stay centered. It's absurd to get drawn down into these reactionary patterns from your past and all that stuff. It's it's not going to go anywhere. You just keep getting lost. Well, not if I can make everybody be the way I want them to be and everybody talks to me the way I want to be talked to and I get financially everything that I want. Everybody respects me. If that happens, I'll be okay. Okay. Waste your time trying to make that happen every moment of your life. It ain't going to happen. Or realize that what you feel when that happens is your mind opens and your heart opens and you feel the flow of self. You feel the flow of Shakti. You feel good stuff comes in. It's in there all the time. It's unconditional. It never goes away. It will never go away. So you have to decide, do I want to go out there and struggle with the world to make it match my psyche? That's called desires and fulfilling your desires and my likes and my dislikes. Go on, devote yourself to that. But I feel better if I get what I like. Absolutely. Good luck. I feel relieved if I don't have to get what I don't like. Good luck. You will struggle. That's the fall from the garden. You fell from the garden, from God, from the highest state. And now you're down here and work by the sweat of your brow. That's what the Bible says. You do work by the sweat of your brow, don't you? To try and be okay. Every minute of every day. (laughs) Right? Okay. Instead, you do the work inside. It's not renunciation. It's it's rational. It's it's meaningful. Inside, learn to stay in the seat of self more often. How? By letting go of the small stuff. And then the next thing you know, that which seemed to be a little bigger than the small stuff will seem small. If you can play the scales, you can play twinkle, twinkle. If you can't play the scales, you can't play twinkle, twinkle or anything. You haven't learned anything. It's the same thing here. I started by telling you there's different stages of your growth and you think you're somewheres. 
I'm laying it out for you. You're somewheres when you feel the pull and you have the right to let go. You don't pull it back. Somebody talked about that the other day. You don't fight with your mind. Don't ever fight with your mind. Don't ever fight with your mind. Why? Because that's your mind fighting with your mind and you lose. To me, fighting with your mind is equivalent to arming both of your right hand and left hand with knives and say, go at it. <laughs> no, 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 no win there. <laughs> okay, go fight each other. You don't fight with your mind, you let go. You sit in the seat of self, you notice the nature of mind, it gets distracted, it's got opinions, it does all this stuff. Do I try to stop that from happening? Someone once said to me, but how do I get rid of my preferences? You don't. You don't get rid of your preferences. You get rid of the reason you have preferences. That's called working at the root. Buddhists say work at the root. What do you mean? What's the reason I have preferences? The reason I have preferences is because you're blocked. And you, you're not open all the time. You're blocked. And if you're blocked, you don't feel good. It doesn't feel right. Of course it doesn't. Therefore, I try to find people, places, and things that will unblock me. Right? You turn me on. That's what it means. You turn me on. I get so high and uplifted in your presence. I've loved this job so much. I love my new boss. She's a woman. I never had a woman boss before. Right? You're, you're trying to have situations that will open you. Well, why don't you just find out why you're closed? Instead of making it conditional that things have to be exactly the way your mind and heart want them to be for them to open. Why don't you go inside and say, Hello, Mr. Mind, Miss Heart. Haven't you found out that if you'll open, it feels good? So why do you need things to open you? Why are you closing? If you like it so much, go and get turned on by something. You're going to close. There's no way you're staying that way. Is there? Go have a great meal. How long before you complain about something else? <laughs> well, why? You, you opened. Why don't you stay open? Okay, that's spiritual growth. It's not about getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want. It's about finding out why you're not open enough to where you couldn't care less. Preferences fall off when you're filled with ecstasy. If you've got this beautiful flow of energy flowing inside of you and you realize it will never stop. Oh my God, I want the day. I want to look in your eyes the day you realize that. One, you realize it's there. And two, you realize it will only stop if you stop it. Period. You don't want to close yourself. I am not. I just didn't like what he did. There you go. But what if beauty is flowing inside of you and you knew if you didn't like what he did and you closed, you won't feel it. But if it's so beautiful and you say, okay, fine, he did what he did, we'll deal with it. But I'm not closing. I'm not closing. I'm not closing. How about you? Why? I'm, when you close, you're closing to the flow of God. You're closing to the flow of Shakti. You're closing to the flow of ecstasy. I'm closing to the flow of ecstasy so that someday I can find it again. I'm going to close to the flow of ecstasy so that I can train you to be the way I want you to be so that when I meet you, I'll feel some ecstasy. But I, I don't understand what you're doing. It is inside. So what you do is not struggle so much to get what you want and avoid what you don't want. It's to take a look inside and find out why you even have wants. And it's because you're closed. It's because you're blocked. Otherwise, it's just beautiful in there. So this is the growth. Now, we talked about witness consciousness. Eventually, you get to a point. If you will practice, you will get to that point, period. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing to do but practice what I'm talking about. People say, well, what about doing this or doing that? If you're not letting go, you can do anything you want, and you can have a nice experience, but it will go away. If you're in there working with yourself and realizing the problem is that the God, me, God, is being distracted by this stuff that was going on inside of me, including the fact that it's raining out. I was so excited about going canoeing, and now it's raining, so I'm going to get depressed. Well, that's ridiculous. Just do something else and stay excited. There's lots of things to do to me, except it doesn't have to be the way you want, and instead you close. So basically, eventually, if you will practice with the simple stuff, what do you practice? Let go. When it starts to close, let go. When it starts to pull your consciousness down into it, let go. Don't let go of the rain. Don't let go of your eyes. Don't let go of realizing it's raining. Don't let go of the mind. Let go of the rope back here where you're seated. You'll feel it start to pull down. Eventually, it goes in slow motion. I, went, I love talking to you. Literally. Right now, what happened like that will be... Mm. Then, then something inside, way deep inside, you sure you want to go back down there? <laughs> and you will have the right to say, nah, I can handle it. The food's not as hot as I want it to be. 
or that there are the six less P's than I expected. <laughs> I think I won't go down for that. All right, thanks for reminding me, all right? And so you let go, and you let go, and it's gone. You let go, it's gone. But the pull is gone. The pull downward is gone. Then you get to sit in the seat of self. And it's very beautiful there. And eventually you won't leave. So that's what this consciousness. You now can walk through your life experiencing your thoughts, your emotions, whatever. They still can react. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you let them go, it doesn't matter. Robert Christian said it's like riding on water. What difference does it make? If your mind starts to pull out towards something, you let it go. What difference does it make that happen? It doesn't matter. But if it starts to pull out and you go with it, or you get mad at yourself, if you get mad at your mind because it started to pull out, go on, get lost again. Let go, let go, let go, let go. If you let go, you stay seated in the seat of self. It didn't get pulled out. That's what you're letting go of. Well, why did I say that witness consciousness is not such a high state? Remember I started this talk by saying people think they're somewhere. Don't ever think that. Because someday you're going to wake up and realize I was nowhere. No matter how high you are. No matter how high you are. So get seated in the seat of witness consciousness. Be able to handle every single thing that happens in your life from a quiet, centered place and make really good decisions and help people and serve. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now what happens? Eventually, you will feel the joy. You will feel the love. You will feel the peace. And it will dawn on you, not your mind. It's intuitively, it will dawn on you. Wow, there's this beautiful flow of Shakti, a spirit flowing inside of me. Where does it come from? Everything comes from somewhere. Where does that come from? I've already lived in it for years and years. I know it won't go away. It's very beautiful. And I can handle the world because I'm centered. But where does this come from? Now you're ready for the next stage of your growth. And what you will find is if you stop looking down at all, you're still looking down, but you handle what you're looking at. It's not pulling you down. When you stop even looking in that direction, you will realize this thing that will just blow you away, which is, wait a minute, I'm staring at me. It's a nice me. It loves his neighbor as itself. It, it just takes care, it serves. I don't have needs and desires aren't messing me up. It's, that's a nice thing I'm looking at. Who's looking? It's still the question, who's looking? That's why spiritual ego can be the biggest trap. Because you think you're there. I can handle anything. I feel joy all the time. Who's this I? Who's this I? It's still looking at a little tiny thing in the universe. It's so small, you can't even find it with an electron microscope. You're taking up you know, three feet of space on a tiny, tiny planet, okay? And, and I told you, 1.3 million Earths are inside the sun, and there's 300 billion suns in the galaxy, and there's two trillion galaxies. Yeah, you're really important. You're doing just great. I'm just so glad to hear that you just don't lose your center anymore. When you're done with yourself, Christ said you must die to be reborn. That's what that means. When you're done looking at yourself, no matter how nice it is, no matter what's going on. I'm not looking in that direction. You will realize you've been staring at one tiny thing. Look up, look around. There's the rest of the universe. And at that moment, you will start to feel a pull upward instead of downward. Now you don't realize you're trying to let go of being pulled down because the pull is down, all right? Now the pull will be up. It will start to pull you up. I don't know how to talk to you about it. And it's, it's just, you know you have to let go, but now you're talking about dying. You're dying of the individual self. You're dying of the sense that I am separate. Because you're not separate. You are the sun. You're a ray of the sun. But while you're so involved in what you're shining on, you won't realize what's behind you, where you come from, your source. And it starts to pull you up. Why? Because you're letting go. And it's like calling you to let go. Come home come home. And the great ones, the truly great ones, let go. They just let go completely. Mary Baba said, when I reached that state, my consciousness was like a drop of water staring at me. It fell into the ocean. Find it. Find a drop of water you drop into the ocean. Will you ever find it? It does what we call merge. What does the word yoga mean? Union. Merger. That's, those are the states. The great ones were merged. Christ, did he say that? My Father and I are one. So that drop falls into the ocean, and you are no longer an individual. It is the whole. And can that whole exist here on earth? Wow. 
Yes. That's what a master is. That's what Christ was. That's what Buddha was. That's what the great ones are. They are literally the one eternal self, the whole universe, looking down through those eyes. It's a pretty special thing in it. All right? I'll stop with this. I have trouble stopping. I will stop because I get you where I want to talk to you. All right? Christ said, as I sit by the throne of my Father, well, my Father and I are one. The throne is a state of consciousness. As I sit by the throne of my Father, so you shall sit by my throne. And these things that I do, you should do these and even greater things. What's he telling you? You're it. The same thing Buddha told you, the same thing all of them tell you. You're a very great being looking down at something that's a flame of mess, isn't it? And you're trying to solve the mess by getting what it wants. You're going to the mess. Here, your kid is three years old. What is it? Terrible twos, terrible threes, whatever it is, right? And you're sitting there throwing a tantrum in the middle of the apartment store. I'll tell you, here's what you should do. Sammy, Sammy, wait, wait, stop crying. What do you want? I'll get it for you. What do you want? Just tell me. Which one? This one? That's what you should do to that child? That's what you're doing to yourself. You're going to the neurotic mind that's all mixed up, messed up because it lost God, and you're saying, what do you want? What do you want? Should I get this? How should I make it behave? What should I tell them? I... Exactly the same as trying to give that kid every single time it's throwing a tantrum exactly what it thinks it wants. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When you are willing to let go of that part of your being, you get pulled up all by itself. You don't have to do anything. Jagger